renewals, what we want to do in the discussion is to start to put things together. And so, uh, like the, the time where Nehemiah led the building of the wall, he, would, he built uh, groups of laborers together, and they each built different sections. And when it then, to, to put it all together, each section had to, had to fit together, you know. So it wasn't all just independent works. It was all one work with a lot of different, different laborers in different places. So, so what we want to do is to start putting things together. The things that uh, Brother Al uh, brought to us, they, they really do fit together with the things that Brother Tony uh, brought to us. And so that's what we want to start, start to do is put things together. Now, there, there are a few uh, rules that I, that I want to um, uh, establish here, and I, and I put 10 together because I thought that was there's good precedent for having, having 10 rules. So the first is uh, no flesh should glory. That's the first rule. Uh, second, all men should honor the son. That's number two. Number three, there should be no schism in the body. Number four, he that ploweth should plow in hope. Rule number five, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Rule number six, we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Number seven, you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness. Number eight, we should love one another. Nine, we should believe on the name of his son. And ten, you should earnestly contend for the faith. So I can leave this list up here if you need to refer to them later. And as long as we stay within the parameters of those, of those ground rules, then, then we'll be sure that all things will be done unto edifying. So first I wanted to uh, give opportunity uh, for there to be direct responses from the messages. I know a lot of, a lot of you are uh, note takers, and so we want to open this time uh, with uh, giving responses, direct responses to the things that have been brought to us uh, this week. I know that as you sit and, and listen to the, uh, to the brethren laboring in the word and in the doctrine, it's as, as though we're, uh, we're, fo we're following in the journey down this road uh, that we're being that we're being led down by by the, the the ministers, and you you see things. Even it might not be a brand new thing, but but it looks new as you're being led uh, led down this this uh, this straight and narrow way. You see something again, and it's like it's being brought out of out of your out of your bag again, and it, and it becomes new, brand new again. And so we we're, we're open now. If anybody we do need to come up front here. Um, direct responses to the what should we say to these things see the truth does the truth does require a response no man see everybody had to do something with Jesus you go review the gospels again and you'll find that everyone they did something with Jesus no one could remain neutral and that's the nature of the truth the nature of the kingdom is that you will do something with it so what shall we what shall we say to these things as an example maybe uh, maybe someone has a judgment on Brother Jason's message. Maybe uh, Brother Ricky, he preached that Jesus filled all things, so maybe you saw something else that Jesus filled. See, the, as, these things, as these things grow, then you, you begin to... Maybe you saw that the footstool of Jesus' footstool that Brother Dan ministered to us, you see that those are the ones that are against you, but they're under Jesus' feet. You see that? The, uh, Brother Jeremy ministered to us, that, we, that he is far above all principality and power, that you realize those are the principalities and powers that you're wrestling against, and that's why we have success in our wrestling, because he's above those whom we are wrestling against. So it's wonderful how the, the truth... Um, blends together you know Paul really didn't argue with James it all it all goes together there wasn't any confusion between the two and um, it, it's it is you one thing that you find as you articulate the truth is you you first prove to yourself what you know and what you don't know by what you can say and what you what you can't say and what you, what you might think, oh, I understand that, and you, tar you start to articulate it, then you start to prove to yourself what you, what you really know. And that's one, uh, one value of the, uh, of the discussions that we have. Are there any, any that would like to begin with uh, responses to the, uh, the meetings directly? 
the uh, main things that has uh, dawned upon me through through all of these and things that we've been given to see lately is that uh, these things are all a revelation of the very person and character of God Himself. I mean, as we even as we consider the exalted Christ, there is a purpose that God has purposed in exalting Christ. This is a, this is for our God is a God who does nothing without cause. So all the things that have been uh, declared and, and revealed and opened up to us uh, these last couple of days all goes back to the glory of God. He is, he is a God who has determined to make himself known to his creation. This is, this is the work that God is doing. He is doing an effective work that he himself has purposed. Now he purposed this purpose from it's an eternal purpose. He purposed it from before the foundations of the world. And in order for that purpose to be fulfilled and accomplished, we heard that he's, it's, he's, it, there's a required one that is, he needs in order for that purpose to be fulfilled, and that's his Christ. He sought this one out. He found him. He chose him. He elected him. He upheld him. He put his spirit upon him. And now Jesus is the one who is effecting and accomplishing everything that God himself has purposed. So his, his, his death was an accomplished and accomplishing death. So was his burial. So was his resurrection. And so was his exalt, exaltation into the right hand of the majesty on high. All of these workings of Jesus are unto accomplishing that purpose which God himself has purposed from the very beginning. From the very foundations of the world, this work is being now effectually working. It's working. There are, there are, there are evidences of that working as I look around here. He's working, he's working that work as he had determined in his people. There's also evidences that we don't see, but we believe they're being, uh, they're being accomplished in the heavenly places. By the, by the angels and the principalities and powers, they are being given to see more of God because that's what he purposed. That's what he desired, to, for himself to be made known to all the creation. And the announcement of the gospel is that this is all being done by, in, through, and because of Jesus Christ our Lord. I have two more sermons left, and I've, I'm filled. First thing is, I have two, um, Brother Ricky. If your eyes are, he was speaking of looking above, and thought if your eyes are focused on, a, on things above, setting your affections on things above, you don't really notice what's happening in the world. Your physical circumstance, you give God the glory, I thought of Job. He's a perfect example. The things of the earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory, which does come from above. And also, Brother Ricky said, he, Jesus didn't just ascend past the starry sky. He said he ascended all the way past man's knowledge of the universe. And the half hasn't yet been told, but man does know about the universe. I say this because we have no knowledge of the whereabouts or dimensions of heaven. And it just transcends our knowledge. And if Jesus stayed in an area that we knew about, then we would be putting our hope in something seen. thought of this text in Romans chapter 8, verses 24, 25. For we are saved by hope, and hope that is seen isn't hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Brother Tim McCulfer said, the knowledge of the kingdom of God is an escape hatch from a condemned world. And as children of God, we'll take the escape hatch every time. We don't belong in this world. It's just a temporary home. One more thing that Brother Boyce said. I think he might be my new favorite speaker for this renewal. He said, come here, the only commandment that the Virgin Mary ever made. Whatever he says, do it. So that's a good exhortation because when we are obedient, we are portraying Christ's nature. As his children, we take on his personalities and we do what he does. And when we are obedient to him, 
we are showing that we are rightfully his children. There were several <clears throat> thoughts that were, were coming to me as the brethren uh, were preaching. And yes, regardless of what I looked like, I was thinking and listening while you were preaching. So as the word, <clears throat> Jesus was God. When we talk about the Son and Father, we're talking about these things on this side of what he has done. We have to remember that in the beginning, the Word was God and was with God. He wasn't, he wasn't the Father, he was the Word. We're not, we're, we're not mixing all of this up. But he was, he was in on the plan. He wasn't just dispatched as he were another creature created by the Father, but he as one of the persons equal, there was equality in the Godhead at that point. That's why Philippians tells us he didn't think it a thing to be grasped at. He was God and he was in the beginning when this purpose was laid. So. It was good in the sight of the Word as well as in the sight of the Father that the Word should be made flesh. In doing that, the person of the Word willfully took on that, that humility. And this is a continual humility. Not, not Well, I shouldn't say humility because he's exalted now, but, but it's a, a permanent change. Think about that. A permanent change in the Godhead. Exactly. That, that one of the, per, instead of that equality being, being present in the same sense, there's still a oneness though. That's what, what we don't lose sight of. That just because the son became subject does not mean that he ceased to bear the same character that he had in the beginning. Or that he was he he didn't cease to be the, the the title son of god implies as the jews knew when they were they were going to stone him to death for for saying that he makes himself god because he took that title to him they understood as as oftentimes we do not what that title implies that means he was both god and man uh, a very weighty consideration but in uh he was before all things. So we talk about the exaltation of the Christ. It, he's, it's as though when he, he, vac he didn't vacate, but whenever he left for a while and came and, and was humbled and found in the fashion as a man, and he took on the nature of those that he came to save. Whenever... It, this is still all God doing this. The Father was in the Son, uh, reconciling the world unto himself. Yeah. There's a oneness here that exists that is beyond our present comprehension. He was, he was the person of the Godhead that actually came and accomplished that experientially. But the entire Godhead was doing a work together. Now, he was before all things, but as the Son of Man, the character of God was tried in weakness. We're talking about the glory of God when we're talking about salvation. It's bigger than men. Salvation has always been about God. Amen. And about when we say the glory of God, we're talking about God making himself known as he truly is. Think about what a wonderful thing it is that we men can talk uh, with, with knowledge, you know, having a knowledge, talk about God, that we can talk about what God likes, what God does, what God did, that we would know this. It, how would this be known? Christ, yeah. the word became flesh. He was the Christ of God to accomplish his purpose and the Father's purpose and the Spirit's purpose from the beginning. But he's the one that, that, that actually experienced the, the being uh, humbled. Now, Brother Jason, whenever he was uh, preaching, one of the 
One of the things that occurred to me is that the devil is a hostile witness to the ministry of Christ. A hostile witness is one that doesn't like to give evidence in favor of. But the fact that he is being overcome, the fact that he does oppose the Father and that he's, he's thwarted and, and that God prevails, he's a hostile witness. And the, the character of God is seen perfectly in the Son. Perfectly. He came and even in the flesh, there was no deviation between what he ever was before. He maintained his integrity, even in wick and weakness. Um, it's that whenever, uh, whenever Jesus came, he came and what we saw with our eyes was a man. Now, by faith, and by faith we now do this, we see that he was much more than a man. But it, at no time did he cease to be glorious. At the Mount of Transfiguration, we see a figure of this. God didn't dump some glory on him there. His glory was breaking out and was witnessed. Jesus has always been glorious. He wasn't always Jesus, but he was the person of the word now the son of god see if he's changed we have to we have to talk about him a little bit differently now because this is a continuing work so what he came to accomplish is a continuing thing and he must maintain that that what he has established whenever he came here he didn't come and do something and wash his hands of it and now he's gone and done something different he this is he's always going to be the man christ jesus at what, at what point he ceases to be the man Christ Jesus, we cease to be sons of God. Um, just one more thing. I won't talk a whole lot longer. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And they've always been one. We're being called into that oneness because of we call it his humiliation when he came and emptied himself. But his exaltation is the rightful return to the place. It has always belonged to him. He was the, every expression that we know about the Father, with the two possible, now it, you, you might correct me on this, I don't know, you think, and, and maybe you can come up with something I didn't. But I know of only two things that, that we didn't get directly through the Son or through the Word. And that is whenever the Father spoke out of heaven at the time of Christ's baptism and at the time of the transfiguration when he spoke about his Son. So that was provoked by Christ. You look at the entire creation. Who did that? It was all things were made by him. And there was not anything made that was made whether they're things seen or unseen, principalities, powers, dominions, all things were made by him. So what we can see of the Father in anything that has been created, it has been the word that communicated that, so to speak. It was, he took the mind of God and made it material, so to speak. Whenever um, it, Jesus is the revelation of God to men, he Think about his title, the Word, the Word. He, he is the communication of the Godhead to us. So it was meet for him to be the one to show us the Father. And, show it, and the Father, whenever the Father gives us to see the Son, who do we see? We see the Father because that's who Christ shows us. So we're, we're knowing God in totality through the means of Jesus. Everything comes to us by him and through him, and everything that flows back from us to the Father goes through him, or it's not acceptable. This, this exaltation of Christ is a right thing. There, uh, there are many reasons why no one, no one, no creature could have, the. Really, when you think about it, the Father couldn't have done this. The Spirit couldn't have done this. It had to be the person of the Word 
that became the Christ. In order for the purpose, as we, as it's been revealed to us, to have been established. And so it is, this exalted position is his by right. He was, no one could have brought us to the Father, but he that came from the bosom of the Father. You can only bring somebody as far as you can go. Nobody had been with the Father in the beginning. So when we talk about our salvation, the exalted Christ, uh, that should really fill our hearts with what exactly God is giving us in salvation. This is not a little thing. We're going to, uh, the things that scripture tells us, we're going to judge angels and things that we can't even imagine at this point. But why? Because, and he prayed it in the garden, that we would be one with them, even as the Father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father, and us in Him. See, we've been called into very high places, and it, um, it provokes in me a great thanksgiving. A response to something you said, Brother Tony, from Psalm 89 about God's promise to exalt one chosen out of the people. Appreciate it. You said this was something which is primarily to Jesus, secondarily to David. Uh, a verse kind of going along with that. David describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So David received that blessedness because of Christ. And in the same way, all these things we're talking about with Christ being exalt exalted, we get in part a second, secondary blessing from God's blessing of Christ as we are exalted together with him. I want to comment on how all the brethren, their presentations blended together and some things I perceived in their manners. I'm not sure whether I mention everyone here or not. If I don't, it's, it's not been on purpose. I thought of uh, Brother Dan Bruick. Brother Dan is a, is a teacher. Uh, not a boring teacher. But a teacher where you, you feel like you're in a classroom and there's just uh, like a, the water being poured out. It's, it's a gift. Now, Brother Boyce, he, uh, he speaks to our hearts. You probably notice that when he speaks, it kind of draws your heart. I thought of Brother Silas. He's an example of a dedicated youth. His youth hasn't interfered with his spiritual life. Now, a lot of youth, their youthfulness interferes with their spiritual life. Brother L, he's like a strong ox plowing in the field. You know, <laughs> turning up different things. Brother Leon, you get a He's a spotlight preacher. It's like you're discovering something. He's, he's discovering something. He has this ability to see things fresh that maybe have been like hidden beneath the surface. And brother, brother Pat has this. There's a certain freshness that comes when these things are relatively new to you. And you're kind of basking in the newness of it all. And Brother Robert, he's uh, got this holy vigor that uh, is contagious. Yeah. Brother Tim and Brother Gene both, they have, they're guileless. And no artificial veneer. I'm not suggesting there isn't anybody else. I'm just saying these are things that are highlighted. And Brother Ricky, 
you get the feeling that what he sees has actually affected him. He's affected by what he sees. It, it comes across very, very strongly. Whether Jeremy is the epitome of sincerity or single-heartedness. Brother Victor, he has like an orderly edification. <laughs> like it, it's one, two, three, four, but it's not boring at all. It's edifying, and he's got this ability to do that. And we had three of the best testimonies we ever had. Yeah. This doesn't diminish anybody else. I'm just saying that you're very personal. Of course, that's what a testimony is supposed to be. Very personal. But it didn't leave you thinking bad things about them. You know, <laughs> they were able to speak about the part of their life that they have put behind it without hanging a hot, uh, spotlight on top of it, so that's what you think about. And overall, all of these things blend together. It just you got to kind of step back and see how marvelous this is that people of such different temperaments and so forth speak on this subject, and you're not thinking about the differences. I mean, you, you may, maybe never thought of some of the things I mentioned here, but you, you're thinking about what they said and what they taught, and I just... Uh, I was kind of thinking about some of the main thoughts that I had uh, over these sermons and what came together uh, for me. Brother Al had said that God's character is such that must be ministered unto. And when he said it, I thought about that. Yes, there's always we read about God being ministered to, and this is something that we'll continually do. So um, I thought about this, how in the end, um, Christ's exaltation is going to be the ultimate ministry unto God. Um, this one perfect man, this one body of Christ that will be the uh, ultimate thing that will be created from this is going to be a ministry unto God continually because like Brother Aaron had brought out that God will be able to express himself in a way that he has never been able to ex express himself before because then, I mean, we know God wants to be known and through each one of us, he is now expressing these different parts of his personality but then it will be put together so that all of creation will be able to see God for who he is in one one way um, so this made me think also about uh, the majesty that brother Bob said and I thought you know this is really going to be a majestic scene when we see God for who he is we can only see him in part now so then we will be able to, and, and so with uh, Brother Tim and Brother Pat's um, sermons on the kingdom ever increasing, this also gave me to think about this, how the kingdom is in, within us, and this increase is going to be an increase that is continually increasing in the knowledge of God. This, this increase will be um, a continual knowing of God because I think that it's going to take eternity for us to be able to really know our God and for everyone to be able to see this final thing. So I think that has a lot to do with the ultimate, this um, exaltation of Christ. These are two thoughts that Sister June's comments triggered in my thinking. Um, both are in the Gospel of John. You mentioned the two instances where the father speaks of the son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and then secondly, hear him. Also in John chapter 12, Jesus prays, Father, glorify thy name. Mm -hmm. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I've both glorified it and will glorify it again. Most of the people there didn't understand it, but... Um, Jesus prayed that the Father would glorify his name. We're speaking of the glorification of Christ. Remember, in the 17th chapter, Jesus' prayer, 
in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So, the, fa the glorification of the Son and the Father go together. Um, we see the Father through the Son. Many have made that point today. I'm a little inclined to be with Judah on voice as a favorite speaker, but I want to respond to Bob's vigorous and exciting fulfillment of his assignment on the location and exaltation of Christ. Yeah, just recently, this truth, not just of his exaltation, but ours in him, came home to me in a very real way. And as... Uh, I thought on this, I was reminded of an occasion back when Woodrow Phillips was professor at Ozark Bible College. He had this little sign on his bumper that said clergy. Someone challenged him one day, said, now in the New Testament church, there's no division between clergy and laity. Why do you have that sign on your bumper? He said, I have it there to remind me of who I'm supposed to be in him. Maybe we all need to carry a sign. As Brother Given was speaking about the unity of the brothers and sisters coming together, that we all, on our own, separately prepare messages, and you could tell that all the brethren put a lot of labor, labor of love into these messages. They weren't half-hearted. Um, you probably have you ever been to any services where you could tell somebody didn't put a lot of work into it? and you're wondering why are you wasting my time, this isn't going on here. Ex when we're talking about the exalted Christ, this is something very large. And it reminded me of when I first came to Brother Gibb and asked him if I could um, preach. Or actually, I, wanted, I, I was just going to do it. And he said, um, you're not ready. And I, and I said, well, I'll get ready. And he, if you ever, you know Brother Gibb very well, he looked over his glasses and he says, you're not ready. And at the time, it was kind of, it kind of hurt a little bit. But you know what, I, I, looking back, I see what the Lord was doing with that, was preparing me to, to see how important this is. When you're talking about Christ, the exalted Christ, you don't want to be half-hearted about it. Because you, you're going to give an account for every word Every idle word, everything that you say about God's Christ, and if you were half-hearted about it, you're going to give an account for why you did that. Why did you talk about my Christ that way without giving a lot of effort into it? Why were you half-hearted? There's a lot of people going to be giving an account for why they handled the word of God sloppily. Why they handled Christ sloppily. Because this is the exalted Christ we're talking about. And now I, really, I realize how, and I see that you brothers and sisters come, have, been, have taken this seriously. Because it's very serious. We're talking about eternal life here. We're talking, we're talking about what the, the difference between being separated from our God for eternity or dwelling with him being a dwelling place because of the exalted Christ. So I rejoice, and I just, I am very thankful to be a part of you, brethren, here, that when I first became a believer, I longed to be around just one person that was serious. But to spend time with you, brethren, who all of you are serious about this, so serious that you've traveled very far, that you've given up your time, because you see that Christ is worth it. You see that he, he is the exalted Christ. That this isn't this isn't playtime. We're not we're not just we're not just doing oh, I've got nothing else to do, let's just come together. No, no, no. He is the exalted Christ. So I, I I thank the Lord that He has stirred each one of our hearts to see this for how it really is. And this this only can be done by the exalted Christ. To take a people in the midst of a generation like this. We're living in a dry generation. We all got to admit that. 
and to raise people up to be able to take this seriously, it is a work of an exalted Christ. I thank the Lord for this time. Just been thinking about what, what am I going to do because Jesus has been exalted. So I, I just I just jotted these these down. Maybe these will be helpful for you too. These are a lot. I'm not just saying you all do these. I kind of jotted these, these down for me, but I thought it might help you too. What should we do as a result of the fact that he's he's in heaven? He's been exalted. So here's what I wrote down. Number one, we deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Set our affections on things above. Why? Because that's where he is. Number two. We preach the gospel to every creature. He, before he ascended, he said, go, preach the gospel to every, every creature, every, every opportunity you have to preach the gospel. Number three, he said, along with that, he said, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. And then he said, because I'm with you. Even though he's with the Father, he's with us as we do those things. So we want to be doing, doing those things. Number four, be sober-minded. This is, he's been exalted, so this is, this is not a time for us to fall asleep or to become numb or to fall in love with the world. This is not, this, sober means like alert, serious, know what's going on because he, just as he ascended, he's going to descend from heaven, see, someday soon. Number five, the church should join the heavenly assemblies in worshiping the exalted lamb. I was reminded of this when I heard some of the brethren quoting Revelation 5, where all of, the, all of the living creatures and angels were, what are they doing in, in heaven? Well, they're falling down before the Lamb and worshiping the Lamb. So in a sense, when we gather in our own little weak ways, when we gather and we sing and we worship and we pray and we preach, it's like a dress rehearsal for, for glory. So we should, we should do that, not think lightly of our gatherings because we're we're participating in this heavenly reality of worshiping the exalted Christ. Number six, we should use our gifts to build up the body because one of the brethren quoted Ephesians 4, when he ascended on high, he, he gave gifts to men. So we all have gifts that we, we've been given, so we're stewards, so we use those gifts to build up the body because he, he's exalted. And then seventh and finally, we can live rejoicing in the hope of glory. I don't know if you have a tendency sometimes to get discouraged, and I, I do, but we have this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and so it doesn't mean everything's always going to be wonderful, but we can live with a hope rejoicing in the fact that Jesus has been raised and he's exalted and he's coming again. So I just, I just wanted to share that with you, some of the implications that personally I want to be, I want to be doing these things because he's been exalted. Yeah. Amen. I, I sat down and the Lord rebuked me. He said, Are you, you've got to draw some attention to the other brethren. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what I see. These are just things I see. Now, Brother Jason, he has a godly determination. Now, Brother Jason's had some very difficult experiences in the last few years that have caused some people to, to quit. But he hasn't. Godly determination. And Brother Aaron has what I call spiritual intellectual scope. Now, not everybody can be a broad thinker. I don't know that everyone's required to be a broad thinker, but Aaron has this capability to, to get the big picture. And I think of Brother Mike Zoucher, he's like a spiritual statesman. Huh? He just kind of feel like a dignitary. It's a spiritual, I mean, this is a spiritual dignitary. Some people have that kind of posture, you know, when they stand before you. Your brother Jonathan, he's he's got a holy eagerness. <laughs> like if he there's something he's not sure about or wants to know more about, like he digs he digs right in to it. Brother Tony Parker, he's uh, 
He's straightforward, just like scholars don't have a right to disagree with God, you know. It's the way it is. If you notice it, it's the way it is. Some people, they're so flowery, you don't know what they're talking about. And Brother Matthew Cobb, he has a, he has a quick mind. He picks, picks up on stuff right away. Uh, it's not that the others don't. I mean, these are highlights of these, these people. I think I covered everybody. <laughs> but I did. I felt, I'm sorry, I felt, I felt bad about that because all of these brethren, have, they minister to me. I'll share a little something with you here. It's, I've told this to some of you before, but when I retired and we moved to Missouri, I had these grandiose plans, but I just, I, I did misread what I, Lord had sent me here to do. And I was, uh, uh, I was dying. And I kind of, I kind of sensed it. Oh, I had plenty of opportunities to speak and all this kind of thing. But I, nobody was feeding me, and I couldn't find anybody that could actually feed me. And I didn't know what to do about it. I knew I just couldn't like relocate all the time, so I, so I asked the Lord about this. And here's what He told me. He said. Um, just gather around you people that really want to love the truth and really want to know the truth, and you feed them. <laughs> and then they'll feed you. And that's exactly what happened. And I've been able to see further than I could before because I had somebody down now that could minister to me in this area. And these, are, these renewals are an example. <laughs> yeah, brother. It's my son, you know. <laughs> brother Michael. Sometimes he has combined naivete and intellect and sensitivity. And he's wrapped him up in a threefold cord. Like if he doesn't understand something, he won't like put on a veneer. He'll just tell you, well, I, I can only tell you what I see. I don't, he'll just come out and tell you. But now he'll make you think. He's intellectual, he'll make you think. And he's very sensitive and tender. It's a remarkable combination. He's been that way from rather rather young, and if something bothers them, you got to really know him to tell something's bothering him. You have, to, you have to know him. He doesn't wear his feelings on his coat sleeve, or he doesn't advertise what, <laughs> but he's a, he's a rare son. I'm glad, I'm glad he's... I've been considering a little bit about um, Brother Boyce's example of seven steps down and seven steps back up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say a little bit more, and I'm not disagreeing with him, and I know that he would agree with what I'm going to say here, so just that disclaimer. When Jesus descended and then ascended far above, he was not at a disadvantage because he had descended. The Lord, in exalting his Christ, exalted him far above the descent that he had to descend to do the work of God in the earth. He highly exalted Christ far above any descent that he had to take. Now, it's not apparent to all men in the earth. The earth is like a veil for a time that not all men see this exalted Christ. He is made Lord. He's made this prince and a savior, but it's not apparent to all. The ones it is apparent to are the ones he's drawing to himself. That's the greater work that many of you have referenced, that he's doing a greater work now, exalted. He's leading many sons to glory. And I had this mental picture of the people of the Lord casting our anchor. Where did it say? 
are ca are, we're casting our anchor upward, and that's where he's been exalted. So now in this time that he's exalted, where the, the earth is still veiling these things that are happening behind the scenes, so to speak, he is making these connections with all of his people, and he's drawing us up to where he is at. So in the time whenever this earth, this veil is going to be done away, all of these that he's been working in are going to be gathered up with him, and we are going to be revealed with him in glory. That's a glorious thought to me. Thank you, brethren, for your labors. I appreciate all of the messages. The Lord is has blessed our time together thus far, and he's orchestrated it. As many have said, he's, he's knit it together like a fine garment, and we've all been able to partake of it. Brother Tony said something this morning at the beginning of his message as an opening, and he said, the assembly of the saints is a holy place. And I thought that was very precise in, in his articulation in that, because it is, and the reason why it is, is because we come up to where Christ is in his exalted state. And so that's what makes it holy because we're in agreement with what Christ is doing, what he's done, and what he's going to do. And so I was thankful for that, that very precise statement. Um, you, can, you can almost sense that when you come into the, to the assembly. If, you, if you're able to fellowship an assembly where the people love the Lord and, and they're, they're desiring to see more and, and go further and it, obtain more, you can sense that, that there is a holiness about being together with the people of God. Um, something that Brother Pat said, um, he said, to be in the kingdom, we must let Christ rule over us. And I was very thankful for that. Um, being one of the Lord's children, it's a pleasure to have a king that is so high and exalted as Christ is. He's, as it's been mentioned, he's far above any other king <clears throat> so it's a pleasure for us because we know that the Lord is working out our good. So we're willing to serve the king. I want to share a couple of things on this topic and then add uh, one thing uh, as an invitation for more discussion. The, uh, the Apostle John says <clears throat> that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. He didn't say, so will we be, although that's true as well. But he said, so are we. We have boldness now because as he is, so are we in this world. So here's some things about the, the present exalted Christ that we are partaking of. And so it's not that we're outside looking in. It's that we're partakers with him. When it says that we behold as in a glass darkly, it doesn't, he's not saying that we have no participation or no fellowship in it. It means that we're just not seeing it in fullness. We are partaking of, in fact, we partake of uh, to the measure that we see in that glass darkly. So here's some things, some parallels. Uh, one of the brothers uh, ministered that, that he is chosen of God, but well, we've been chosen in him. See, so we're partaking of, of his inheritance all, already. Um, he now appears in the presence of God for us, and we are a kingdom of priests. And so we intercede also to, to God. Um, through whom he shall judge the world, Brother Jason's text. Well, Paul asked, Do, know you not that the saints shall judge the world? So we'll be judging with him. Uh, Jesus is far above all principalities and powers, and we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And so we're there with him in those exalted places. And the, lastly, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and we are laborers together with God. So the Jesus, God, uh, Jesus is like the chief steward. God gave him the government set on his shoulders. But he's also brought us into the labors also. So obviously, too, there's different measures of talents, as in that, that parable. And so Jesus obviously has more than all of us, but there's part of the government that's on your shoulders as well, in him. Now here's something uh, else to add uh, to this discussion, as uh, just to stir up more uh, possibilities, another avenue of, of uh, sharing in these things, that the, the knowledge of the exalted Christ touches directly your walk of faith we walk by faith not by sight Amen. and so this this knowledge of the exalted christ is not like just looking in a crystal ball and seeing something that's that's outside of the world and something that's way out in the future it is it the knowledge of the exalted christ works in us now and i dare say that it has to work in us now uh, lest Satan get an advantage of us. 
So we're not ignorant of, of his uh, devices. The kingdom of God is not in word only. So we're not, and we, we've been, maybe you know, maybe you don't, we've been accused of just talk. It's just a bunch of talk. Well, the, the kingdom of God is not word only, but the truth is expressed in words. It's in, it's in power. It's not just in common words. It's, it's in words that he has, he has ordained. So Satan is a master of distractions. He, he doesn't want you to see that Jesus is presently exalted. So he has c- created a, a, a religion where Jesus stays in, in the manger, right? And he's created another, for, for different tastes, he's created another section of religion where Jesus stays on the cross. That's all he does. It, it, it doesn't go past that. And he has other flavors where really Jesus just works miracles. That's, that's all he does. I mean, see, all, every one of these have, have liabilities. They, they skew the reality that Jesus is presently e- exalted. And so uh, Romans 5 reasons on this wise, that if, if we were reconciled to God by the death of his son when we were enemies, then how much more will we be saved by his life? Amen. Now, that's not just talking about the, the, the final uh, escape out of the world. He's talking about Jesus' life now. He's living, and we shall be saved by his life. That's what I'm talking about, with the, how the present exalted Christ touches our walk of faith today and if you don't see it if you don't see the exalted Christ see you're you're going to have a hard time walking walking and and going forward this is why the exalted Christ is why there has been hymns sung in prison The, the exalted Christ is why there are people that are more than conquerors not just conquerors more than more than conquerors it didn't look like Paul was a conqueror. You see, you look on the outside, and it looked like a lot of people got the best of him, right? And the shipwreck and the beatings and the, and the you could just go, go on and on and on. But Paul didn't, he could, he could have said more about those things than he, than he really did. But he's the one that said, we are more than conquerors. That's, that's evidence that of the, the presently exalted Christ. So as we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, the knowledge of the exalted Christ gives you traction. Working out, see, see, you see what's in your favor. And uh, the, the scripture tells us, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is a, as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. And you know what that means is there's some that he can't devour. He's seeking whom he may devour because not everyone is accessible to him. And those who are not accessible are seated with Christ. In, in heavenly places. So that, that's another area to explore and for you to, um, uh, to, to offer uh, your giving of thanks, your testimony about how the exalted Christ has, has like, like put, it's like, it'll like extend your stride. As you're, you're walking in faith, making progress, seeing the exalted Christ makes your strides longer. So I suggest that also. As our brother was giving his list, here, I wondered if anyone was going to add him to the list. Well, I'm going to be bold and do that. I think of our brother as the prow of a great ship, pressing forward. Not the ark. You know, the ark is just for floating. It wasn't for sailing. And it's certainly not the Titanic. Okay? We're going somewhere. We're going to arrive. And our brother is one in our company. And our company, he's the one that's out front there, pressing forward. And we're not in his wake. Wouldn't want to be in his wake. <laughs> or the Lord's wake. You know, we want, to, we want to travel together. And that's what we're doing. Along with this, I, this just kind of, the light kind of came on for me a little while ago as, as we began our discussion here. And, and I looked at this text here in one of the Psalms. This is one of the songs of the sons of Korah. And for me, these statements uh, put all of these things together that we've been preaching about these days in, in an unusual fashion. Uh, it begins with our longings. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. 
I will hear what the Lord God will speak. And here's what he speaks. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring up out of the earth. Righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good. Our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps into our pathway. So we are walking in that way as we see these things, aren't we? How these things have all fallen together for us as they've been revealed to us and we're declaring them one to another and we're rejoicing in them and exchanging these things one to another for which we give thanks, for which he's granted us to see. I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I saw in this year's renewal so far. Um, Brother Gene said, the thrones and powers of the world are broken, but Christ is forever. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, it says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This world fails, but Christ has nor ever will fail. Brother Dan Bruick said, we are also expecting our, our enemies to be made our footstools. Mm -hmm. We won't have to live always being tempted. There is a time that will come when it will be our day. But for now, the day is for those who are wicked. Their time is now. But we will be rewarded for being steadfast in the Lord. And Brother Silas McCulver said, Man did not exalt Christ. Man crucified Christ. God exalted Christ. It is impossible for man to receive the glory for the exaltation of Christ. Man was unable to exalt Christ because man was under Christ. So the glory and praise goes to God, for he is worthy. In Isaiah 40, verse 5, it says... And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Brother Pat said, There is God's kingdom does not increase, and there or does increase, and there is no end. We also increase, and there is no end to our increasing. There is an end of these things that are wicked, and that is death. Sister Nikki said, we will be made like Christ in all ways. We will be made like him, and Brother Leon said that will be the final restoration. The truth of the ascension of Christ and how that impacts upon our conversation. Brother Dan, you let out on this, on the fact that Christ's enemies are, have become his footstool. But I've noticed that this was something that was addressed by a number of the brethren, and uh, I found that any time that happens, it's like Christ, what he's doing is he's underlining what he's speaking in the assembly. And, uh, and that happened. Uh, Brother Aaron, you talked about the fact that if Christ is, a, is the king of kings, then that means that his enemies are there, but he's ruling over them. See, there are, those are some of the kings he's ruling over. And uh, I know one of the other brothers talked about the fact that sometimes God raises up kings, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar, he chastens the people of the Lord, things like this, to benefit them ultimately. And uh, Brother Silas, you had, you had one of the best ones, brother. That was, that was marvelous. You went back to, back to Haman, that great enemy of Mordecai, and how, how the king forced him. And you brought that out, you know, when the king says to do something, you do it or else you lose your head. And so he, in the interest of his own life, he actually went throughout the city and brought honor to his enemy. And that was a great showing of how God can force his enemies. But let me tell you, what, what, how can we reason on this? Because we realize that God is not just in, or Jesus in his ex exalted state is not just controlling over his people, but he's in control of all things, particularly his enemies. Now I think we can reason a number of ways, and this is some sound reason. One thing is our trials, which are but for a moment, are working for us. They're working for us. All things work together for good, that God can make your enemies be used by him to bless and benefit you. And that's, that's one thing that's been brought out. Another thing is that uh, God will not allow you to be attempted above what you're able. 
He won't. So if you have some kind of trial, some kind of difficulty that you are facing, God knows you have the measure to deal with that. See, that? See, he, he will monitor it to where it won't be above your strength. And, and I'm glad for that. And I know the Apostle Peter also talked about, talked about the trial. It's there if it need be. Need be. Which means there's purpose in it. That's one of the difficult things you have to overcome when you face some kind of a difficulty is realizing that there's purpose in it. It's not meaningless suffering. God won't cause for his people to just meaninglessly suffer. It, it has a purpose, but then he also said it's for a season. See, it's for a season. You found this to be case that your trials, they come to an end when, when maybe they don't, they don't seem like they would, and pretty soon they're just cut short, and pretty soon you're right out of the valley and back on a mountaintop. And so this is a good way of reasoning when we think about the ascension, that Jesus is over all his enemies, and that ultimately we're going to be over all his enemies too, right? That's how it's going to be. So thank God for that, that marvelous bit of edification for all of us. I thought that uh, seeing Christ exalted from this majestic point of view is that's an encouraging perspective. It's good uh, to have that view of Christ. Now, he's been exalted to the highest point, the highest pinnacle, and, it, and it's a majestic place, and, and it's full of glory, and it's in the right hand of the Father, and, and these are good thoughts. But you know, there's a, I thought about this, a practical, very practical aspect here that uh, sort of kind of, I'm, I'm growing in that uh, thinking in that area, at, at, even at this time. But see, now uh, this is a, a very, uh, a, uh, for him, a very advantaged place to be. You know, I thought that many times uh, men themselves uh, who were uh, commanders and, and uh, they would pick the highest point. And that, that's where they watched the battle from. And they, they, were, they were in a position where they could move men. They could see the enemy advancing around in, at a particular point. They could get men over here quick. And so that from those highest points that he was able to, to, to uh, orchestrate the battle in his favor. And I thought about how that God now, he's using, like, like Brother Ricky said, and he's using all these things to perfect the saints. And also Christ has his vantage point. And that was very uh, very edifying to say now he can he can move and he can deploy and he can and he can just uh, do things from this point. So it's uh, it, it's 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 uh, very practical for Jesus to have this uh, exalted place. I was encouraged to see that more clearly. That this is a time where we get to see things from what the brethren have said tied together. So as I read through my notes, I began to see this. Many of the brethren said. Christ is unique, or no other man is like Jesus. Brother Gene spoke of Jesus receiving a kingdom. And this was not just any kingdom, but as Brother Pat said, it was an increasing kingdom without limits. I know it's normal for a king to have a kingdom, but it's, it's not normal for a king to have an eternal kingdom. Brother Ricky spoke of Christ ascending. And I don't know about you, but I've never heard of a man ascending before. Brother Dan spoke of his enemies being made his footstool. His enemies will submit to him. Brother Jeremy spoke of him being powerful. And Brother Jason spoke of him judging the world. Brother Victor spoke of, his, of Jesus' names. And there are many names, as Brother Victor pointed out, and I've never heard of any other man with many names as Jesus. But not just any names, but very powerful names. Brother Aaron spoke of him being the king of kings. Brother Tim and Brother Pat spoke of the government being placed upon his shoulders. And there are many other things, many other sermons that point, show why Jesus is, why that Jesus deserves to be exalted. And I'm thankful that Brother Gibbon chose this topic because I have received much from being able to learn more about Jesus and why he's being exalted. I'm thankful that Jesus sent the Comforter. Um, I'd like to thank the Lord. This has been a, it's been like a, a springtime. You know, it's been like a time of great growth just in these last few days. So it's good to be with you again. Good to see your faces again. I um, want to talk about what Brother Aaron brought out just in the last, last prompting um, 
Jesus' dominion aids us in having dominion over other things also. You know, his, his dominion is where we can find dominion in having subjection over our flesh. You know, it's, it's drawing on that. So I was thinking about it's Christ's dominion and his exaltation that gives the power to the, the word in Romans, you know, that, that Romans 6, 6 chapter there, that let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey the lust thereof. You know, that, you know that's Christ. If Christ wasn't exalted, how are you going to do that? You know, that's, that's, that's how you're going to do it. And then um, just, I mean, so many good things. I feel like there's, there's been all kinds of, like, treasures in the field. This, there's all kinds of them. We're just bringing all kinds of them out here. All the brethren have said really good things. And I've had uh, something, some, the Lord's really opened up to me more on, like, a general sense, more about, like, the field than a particular nugget that's in there or, or a broad sp- scope view that Jesus is, he is really exalted. He is exalted now. Like today, it, like presently, he's exalted. These things that we're talking about, they're not, wait, they're not, we're not like waiting for these things to happen. Yes, Satan wants us to think like, well, you know, you, you just don't, he's not, he doesn't really have any power right now. We're waiting for a day still. We are still waiting for a day. There is still work to be done. I don't, I don't want to say that, but, you know, Jesus is, he's really not any more exalted than he, than he's going to be right as he is right now, you know. And our ability to see that doesn't affect his position. He's he's there. I mean, he's there. The more now, the more you see it, the more you're able to handle it and and make some progress in it. <clears throat> and I, I I I just appreciate that. That I also wanted to. Uh, I, I appreciate that we haven't really. It's, we haven't really been discussing like a position, you know, you, these things that we've been talking about, they're, they're ours, our spirit can bear witness with his spirit, you know, that, and you can really, been able to really get a hold of these things, so I'm thankful that, that the Lord has worked through his body here. The book of Daniel, <clears throat> it said, and I heard, but I understood not, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then we know that there was a spirit of expectation whenever Christ was to come. And so I can't help but think whenever you see the world as it is, how the Lord is opening up things to us, like he's, it's almost as though the end is very near and he is eager to share this with his people. And so it creates in me a great deal of expectation that soon we shall see him. Thank you for your preference. Appreciate that. I just want to piggyback on something that Brother that Brother Ricky Sims just said, this about uh, keeping in mind the the exalted Christ through suffering. Which this is essential that if we're to endure and remain faithful, that the exalted Christ is at the center of our vision or we will not endure it. And there are all different types of suffering. There are just, well, just suffering in general, anything from illness to circumstances. There's suffering through temptation, which we as believers face, which I'm sure we can all testify. There are times in which you really do feel every fiber of what God has put in you fighting against a temptation and repeatedly so and yet you can testify that it did not have to take you and then there's persecutions which we face our brother Paul is one who testified to many persecutions so when we speak of suffering and we speak of the, the exalted Christ, it's not to say that because we have an exalted Christ, we don't feel suffering, or that somehow these things don't become intense for us. That somehow we, we have a, just come to a state of mind where we can rise above these things and somehow we don't feel them. 
In many ways, I believe the children of God feel suffering more, just as I'm sure Christ, Christ suffered above anyone. In fact, keeping this hope of, of exaltation before us, Christ is the premier example of that. He is one who endured the cross, despising the shame, what for the joy set before him. So Paul would say, yes, we are hard pressed. We are perplexed. We are persecuted. We are struck down, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord. But he would also say, we are not crushed. We are not in despair. We are not forsaken. We are not destroyed that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So it's in context, it's in perspective that he can say, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. This is why we can say it is light, because it is for a moment, because it, it is something which we experience, but only after Christ has conquered it. So it's just like we're walking through the residue of these things. They would take us down. There would be no fight. It wouldn't be a suffering we could endure, but because of Christ, it is light. Uh, one thing I noted, and I, and I see it even more now that every, almost each one has spoken, is the working together of God and Christ. And we've, we've talked about how we've been brought into the working of Christ, and that's true, but they're working together before we were even involved in that. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Just, I mean, just looking at the titles, he has been given a kingdom. Who gave it to him? Just go right down through it. God and Christ working together, and we being blessed by being brought into it. The, the creating of the world and all the things that have come since then, all the way up until the exaltation of Christ, have been a a format for God to be more widely known. See, he's, no, he's, he's showing that he can work on more levels. Before he was working in heaven, now he's working on earth at a distance through his son and the Holy Spirit's involved. So you see a great working. Even, even in the picture in Revelation, when you see the one coming on the white horse with his vesture dipped in blood, he's called the word of God. So the word taking, the word being made flesh was not a dissension. It was a, a it was, let me say that in a different way. He descended, but he wasn't less, essentially. See, he's added to. He has more names now than he did before. Well, after hearing you all speak, I'm glad I didn't miss this part of the meeting. I just got back from work just a while ago. <laughs> just a little after this started. Talk about frantic. I give thanks. I'll just give thanks for the meetings in general. I give thanks that I don't have to overcome the things that are said in these meetings. Because I know this, isn't the, this wasn't always the case with many of us. Many of us had to overcome things that we heard when we came into the Assembly of the Saints. Or you would have to, like, you know, pick a pearl and a swine snout, just try to find one thing that was good, and that would be it. That's your meager meal for the day. But here, everything you're going to hear, you know it's going to be good. No matter who it is. No matter who I see on that schedule, I automatically know it's going to be good. So I don't have to look at the schedule and say, oh, it's just Dan Brooke today. I take my time at work. No, I mean, it's Dan Brooke speak. I need to hurry up. <laughs> because I don't want to miss this. It's same with anyone, Brother Al, Brother Doug, Brother Pat, Brother Mike Zouch, or even people that are just speaking in this part, people that don't like, you know, have a sermon necessarily. It's, it just like actually increased my work. I, I made record time today. <laughs> I did, fastest I've ever got my Thursday route done was today, so. Anyway, yeah, I, I saw, yes we did. <laughs> That's exactly where I was going. <laughs> answered, answered, answered prayers on that, so. Uh, yeah, it's definitely been a blessing. It's, it's definitely better that you're having to overcome not going than you are having to overcome going. So anyway, these are recorded, thankfully. Yeah, I don't have to take all your notes away from you to see what you said. But anyway, it's just, it's just a blessing to see everybody here, like particularly during this time, the, the um, testimonies and the general discussion, just seeing everyone just kind of join in and tackle a subject. Now everyone's just growing and in Christ and growing their abilities. No one's saying like the same old thing. Everything's fresh. Everything's consistent. No, nothing's contradictory. No arguments breaking out. Everything's compliment, compliments one another. And even, you know, during our times of meals, 
the discussions keep going on then, you know. I mean, some places, as soon as they say amen, everyone goes back to their carnal ways. They want to talk about their sports or their gardens or what latest movie that's out or what or whatnot, but not here. It keeps on going. People actually open some of these things up more if you listen a little bit. So anyway, this it's just been a great blessing. I'm very thankful that I got to hear you all speak during this time. Brother Aaron, I, I appreciate the question you brought up of how this affects our walk of faith, our fight of faith, because the exaltation of Christ was not done by us. That's obvious. It's also not because of us. It's because of what Christ did, his humbling himself, that he is exalted. But it is for us. He is appearing in the presence of God for us. Now, one effect of this, which the entire, almost the entire book of Hebrews talks about, is it, it talks about the high priest. And it brings us through through the high priest and how Jesus is the great high priest, greater than all the others. And then the conclusion in Hebrews 10 is, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the result of seeing Christ in heaven is that we draw near to heaven too. Christ being in heaven, it shows God's acceptance of Christ's sacrifice because he brought him up into heaven. He was pleased with him. Christ being in heaven means that Christ is there, that when we go up there, he is there to intercede on our behalf. And then that when we've been raised to sit together in heavenly places in Christ, the Christ being in heaven means that we in Christ are in heaven too. We draw near. That's our response to seeing that Christ is in heaven. Something I saw anew in this renewal is how more about how we serve a live and working Christ. And in this we are alive and working too as well. Brother Jeremy said that when men talk bad about Jesus, it makes me mad. And also, this I tied in with what Brother Matt and Brother Tim em emphasized on how Christ rules over a willing people. So, brethren, we are alive. We have, we have feelings in Christ. We are willingly working for him. Because God isn't bringing up robots. He has made man with a mind that can think and a heart that wants and is living. It was willing to serve him. Jesus in this position of being exalted is transforming what was, who was once their enemy is to now servants who actually love him and want to serve him. See, there's a difference between a slave and a servant that I've really been seeing. And this is how a, a slave, they work by force, brutal force. But a servant, they work by willingness and they want to work and they're actually rewarded by their master for it. So we are no longer slaves to sin, but are actually servants in Christ Jesus. And we love to serve our Lord because he is exalted. He is an exalted Christ. He can give us our provisions. He is the one who is helping lead us along. We are not alone in this. And that is what gives us much assurance is that he is exalted. I just wanted to complete my thoughts. Um, of course, we know that even though we're going through all these trials and situations in this life, that there is going to come a time that it is going to be all wrapped up, and that residue is going to be completely done away with. And I just want to make the point that in the midst of a world where a lack of faith, doubt causes people to say, well, why? Why this? Why did this happen? Why is that happening? And they do it as if to say that circumstances somehow judge God. That God is somehow accountable to, well, well, God then, if you're so good, why did this happen? But God is the judge. And isn't that what we've been speaking of? That Christ is exalted. Christ is over these things. Christ is over the circumstances. He's going to make things right. And faith Faith exalts him. Instead of, we won't challenge God, see them, we rest in him through it. I also 
appreciated this truth um, that Brother Silas brought out and how the exalted Christ is able, um, he makes his enemies to submit to him. And, um, and how he brought up that picture of Mordecai and, and Haman. And um, see, the, the one who exalts himself, God's going to abase them. And when Haman thought too highly of himself, um, he was abased. And it was not, he wasn't just abased, it was with great humility. That's one of the things I was thinking about, is how um, the Lord does things in great wisdom. And, um, you know, here he takes Haman, what he thinks, he asks Haman, well, what would you do? Haman tells him all this stuff, and that's what we <laughs> was used to um, go through the streets and exalted someone else. He was abased. But um, anyway, the Lord does this in wisdom. And um, Christ is the only one that deserves to be exalted. And what, so what he says goes, which is completely true. But the goodness of Christ is he exposes why um, people are abased or his enemies are abased. He exposed why. And um, because, well, everyone, Brother Aaron brought out um, Satan that he said, let me just get it real quick. He says, in the brightness of his coming, that will destroy the devil. And I was thinking about that because, see, when Satan works, he works in darkness. And just the appearing of Christ, the brightness of it is going to expose it which is why it's going to render him useless. Everything will be exposed, and that's what that's the destruction in it. And so Christ does, um, because he is exalted, he's able to also show everyone why he is exalted. And um, anyway, well, that was... Uh, or, or admit that I'm thankful unto the Lord for working in the brethren to create an environment of carefulness in matters pertaining to the expression of the person of Christ. That's very precious in my, in my appraisal. That, um, the, in other words, as each of you spoke, whenever you spoke, you were very careful to not misrepresent the person of God or his son or um, put more of the spotlight on you or your understanding perceived, but you pointed the, the spotlight on him. Yeah. What you could see about him, you said, this is, this is him. I appreciate that. Uh, the Lord, uh, one of the brethren spoke about why did this happen? Because the Lord's reigning. See, he's working in us to do these things. And so you see, this is advancement. This is what this is. I, it, we haven't come together to glorify ourselves. Oh, I know we all know this, but I'm giving thanks to the Lord that this is the way it is. Well, we, we haven't come to talk about our difference of opinions. Who really cares about that? But we want to see the exalted Christ high and lifted up because that's, that's when transformation takes place. And um, I noticed as the brother would speak that confidence never morphed into carelessness. They never stepped out on their own. Nope. Assurance never morphed into assumption. It's like you got assurance in this thing. If it's real, you can talk about it without assuming that you can talk about it. And proclamation never translated into pretense. Like I'm just, I'm, I want to say something so bad I'm going to say it, whether it's right or not. I know you've all heard these kind of things. But see, I'm giving thanks to God because we are we're witnesses today. This, this, this week of Christ being exalted, lifted up, to whatever degree you can see him, you can lift him up. Praise God. Amen. Okay, I can't remember the ten rules, so you may have to go over them again. Yeah. But the first four, I remember the first four, and that's why probably everybody's here, because of the first four aren't violated. The fifth, everybody is here because of the fifth. We all believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, okay? That's what I believe. Now, every speaker, when we listen to them, they say little things, we pick up phrases, and I'm not gonna name any because I can't, I didn't take enough notes, you know, to, to do that. 
but Brother Bob did say something that really struck me well. He said, the exalted Christ. Christ is exalted, okay? And in being, be, being there, he sent the Spirit to us, and now we're hardwired. I like that. I like being hardwired, okay? I got a very solid connection to God. I like that, okay? But anyway, what I, another thing I want to say is, the subject matter everybody knew for a year was the exalted Christ. And everybody looked forward to it, it's the exalted Christ. But a lot of other things were covered. There's at least four speakers talked about the impossibility of God saving us without a man. Four speakers talked on that. All right? That it's all it's all knit together, like we talked about, it's all knit together, but that wasn't really the subject matter. Okay? But a man through a man, sin, sin entered the world, and a man was going to redeem us. Okay, you talked about that. Another, I got to mention Brother L, because Brother L, I'll use your term, nailed it down. God had to use a man, because he, he didn't, he, there was no way for him to fully understand. I, know, I say, all things are possible with God. Well, there's things God can't do. He couldn't understand a man without being in a man. So that's what he did. All right? And in doing that, now Christ suffered, and he said he was made perfect through suffering. Perfect. You mean he wasn't perfect before? He's made perfect in the fact that he can understand us, he can be our high priest, and now talk directly to God on his right hand and say, that's my son. That is my son. That's your son. He's in me. He's perfect. That's, that's good for me. That's very good for me. Anyone need help down at the stirring of the waters? I know it can be hard because don't crawl over. Okay, I just want to give one, one more opportunity for anyone that maybe, maybe had done this a, a few times. I know I did. <laughs> okay, let me conclude these things with just a few thoughts. <clears throat> we all have experienced <clears throat> that bag that Jesus talked about of taking things out of it, things new and old. And the renewal is, is one of those times, uh, like a high time, that's a good phrase uh, to use, a high time in the year where we, we do a lot of, of bag inspection, pull, pulling things out and and, and, and looking and sh shining up and things. And, and we've experienced that again uh, this week. Here's one of the great things about the, the kingdom of God is that uh, when the Lord adds to your bag something new, it doesn't displace anything that's already there. It all fits in. And see, it, it's, even, even, though it's, even though it's new, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't cause um, upheaval. It doesn't cause a lot of... of um, uh, it doesn't cause distress, at least not to the other things that he's given you in your bag. Now, I know that there's other, there's other things to say. Brother Leon knows where I'm going with this. That it, it will cause, when the Lord gives you something, it, it will cause some upheaval with regards to the flesh. I'm talking about the bag that he's given you. You think of it as the new heart, uh, the new man, the inner man. Uh, the inward parts like David talked about, that's what I'm talking about, is that what the Lord gives never does compete with other things that the Lord gives. In fact, it's just the opposite, is that in his light, we see light. And so as you, you take this, this gem out of your bag and you examine it, the exalted Christ, or whatever aspect uh, that is that, that you're looking at, it makes all of the other gems in your bag, it makes them all glow. It, it adds to it, and it enhances and complements. And um, Brother Al, I love one of the things he said a, a long time ago, and, I've, and this comes back again and again. The truth has a value of its own. And when the Lord gives it to you, it doesn't, it doesn't need additives. Or any, it, he's, it's, 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 uh, it's self-enhanced when the, when the Lord uh, gives it to you. And so this is a time where we all have been in the, uh, the position of Apollos, where somebody has ex expounded to us the ways of the things of God more perfectly. And we all are uh, adv advancing 
And so God has given the increase um, among us. We, our labors are, are planting and watering. And it is, it is God that, that giveth the increase. So you always want to give glory uh, where glory is due, where it, where it belongs. And so we give all of you thanks for your labors in watering and in planting. And, but we give God thanks for the increase because that's where it, that's where it comes from. And lastly, Paul prayed, and someone mentioned about the prayers of the apostles, and I, I give thanks for that. He prayed for the Ephesian church who was one of the more commendable churches in Scripture. He said things to them that he didn't say to other churches because he was able to say it. You know, Jesus didn't waste words. He said, I have many things to say to you now, but you cannot bear them. But when the time comes that you bear it, be sure that he will tell you. But he doesn't tell you before. And so Paul was able to open himself, uh, open up the truth to the Ephesians more. Than, but even though that, that condition was true of the, of the Ephesians, he still prayed for them. And one of the things he prayed is that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened. So the enlightening of the heart is it, it begins and it continues. And that's one, of the, that's one of the glory. So the path of the just grows brighter and brighter unto the, unto the perfect day. And so I give thanks, as I know all of you do as well, uh, for, the, for the increase of the enlightenment, the increase of the path as we, as we continue to, uh, to grow. And that as you, as you add to your bag, you don't, you don't ever have to unload something to make room. He'll, he'll, he'll increase your heart. He'll increase the bag so you can just, you can, uh, you can contain more.